check good afternoon guys welcome ev everyone in settle down right after the lunch um we'll talk about continuous online learning today uh, it's it's a it, it has been a very old uh, learning method but it's been resurfacing uh, with some of the bells and whistles of uh, some of the new techniques and optimizations computing speed etc whatever we have come across in the last 4 5 years um let me give you a quick um this is a problem which i'm going to walk through throughout the talk um online learning is applicable in various domains today we are going to witness um one of the more challenging domains of twitter which essentially is um is a very noisy medium uh this is a quick chart 70% of the noise is already there when consumers are engaging with businesses um that's another thing that there is a 100% noise when businesses uh, communicates to uh, their consumers um so we chose to work on a problem where uh, in customer service uh, we are listening on behalf of brands and we are trying to figure out what is it that the brands can go and make actions on um if you see spam identifying spam in is could be modeled as a classification problem uh, you go about uh, setting up as a classification setting uh, acquire good quality data set um you know select a learning algorithm and then train test tune uh, reach to uh, benchmark accuracies or better than base level accuracies go beyond 80% and you can start using them into your production systems um however as we go ahead uh you would see that the accuracies of what you had built over a time uh would start deteriorating uh the performance is going to start degrading uh as the time passes by and this is where i want to introduce this concept of non stationary distributions and what we're looking twitter as a language as a um, as a data set uh it's it's essentially a non stationary distribution where if you think of a stationary process this uh is essentially assumes that everything is time independent which means the averages of all the measures which you have counted over a time remains constant um if you're able to see i've brought out some of the four um um important i would say orthographic features of this data set uh, it talks about how the emoticons are getting used over a time and on the horizontal scale what we have is a month on month and we are running a data um, uh, analysis of 24 months um how the feature uh, as emoticons is getting used so this is an average of how what is an average of a, of finding an emoticon in a single tweet or versus what is the average of finding a url or a hashtag or a handle in the tweets so this over a time is the average is drastically changing too um and this is something which is uh, which is a characteristic of a non stationary distribution so our whole game today is going to be catching up those uh, non stationary distributions uh, this is another one where i uh, put them into two different classes one is a spam other is not uh, and how uh, the averages in itself uh, is sometimes at times uh, uh, there is a two times difference between one versus the other which helps in generalizing the problem from a modeling uh, perspective uh, but there is an inherent uh, non stationary distributions flowing within each one of them as well so see twitter as a new language and you would realize that this language evolves faster a significantly faster than our languages of how we communicate otherwise and twitter is also a communication medium so this puts pressure on linguists to uh, machine learning researchers as well who are building solutions on top of twitter to be able to understand this data set much better so here is uh, one i want to talk about this but let's look at from a language perspective um this is this is a, a zipfian fit 
of a Twitter language. Um, and Zipkin, again, it's, you know, it's a, it's, people have studied Zipkin quite a lot. Um, and this could also become um, a philosophical context as well that everything in this world could be Zipfian. But the best way to look Zipfian is a, a Zip's law is that anything which follows the Zipfian is perhaps normal. What is not normal? I'll show you another one. This is this is another the same corpus essentially, but look at the uh, how how it violates the Zipfian fit as well. And this is just because the preprocessing was not handled carefully. So just a quick takeaway, your preprocessing can, can um, increase the accuracies or uh, what you expect from the models quite, quite greatly. Let's understand this idea of evolving vocabulary, evolving um, dictionaries as well as we go ahead and Twitter. This is on the, on the, let's begin with the right extreme. These are the new tokens versus the um, unseen, new unseen tokens and the new tokens which we are seeing each month as they are coming inside. Um, on the middle is the new tokens, new unseen tokens which we are observing each month versus the cumulative growth of the vocabulary. And this comes out around 8 to 12 percent um, between the months and sometimes shooting up to even to 20 to 25 percent each month, which means that if, if you have built a batched learner um, on a accumulated high quality acquired data set, uh, there is a possibility that you are going to see a lot of um, uh, misfires or your, your features wouldn't get activated because you haven't seen those words or vocabularies before. Um, on the extreme left side, again, is this percentage, it's, it's essentially a zero to one score, which means percentage would be around 10 to, uh, under the bracket of less than, almost less than 10%, uh, stabilizing over the last two years, but still maintaining a 10% vocabulary change each month. It's outrageous. This is, this is hard problem. So, there's an experiment. Um, I, I couldn't get the time to uh, build out a nice chart for this, but uh, whenever you approach, you can also see this. Um, this experiment essentially um, encourages us to think if we were to do continuous learning, what does it mean? Which means, go ahead, build a classifier on a predetermined, pre-acquired uh, data set and run the evaluation. So in this case, we were running the evalu evaluations on the quarterly snapshots of the uh, two-year period which we, uh, which we built this um, today's talks uh, analysis on uh, versus compare this with consistently building with the new data which this is working on as well, which means as we go ahead in the quarters, we are also taking that data and building a new classifier and seeing whether this classifier outperforms the batch classifier which was built um, on the previous data itself. And we consistently see uh, that this way of including new uh, data samples increases the accuracy scores uh, easily by 10%. So again, capturing this notion that what if we were able to do continuous learning all the time? Um, there are some possible solutions, approaches. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about them and bring out some of the policies as well. Um, Reinforcement learning has been championed. We have, we have been recently hearing how uh, popular this algorithm has become and how um, some of the large uh, Googles and the Facebooks are capitalizing on it. Here's the problem. For a binary classification, the MDP, the Markov decision process, uh, it's too small uh, for just consider two classes and it doesn't learn much. Um, in case you guys have worked on it, please let us know. Uh, there is another thing called mini batches. Mini batches is where um, you can reduce, and this is uh, uh, what you can do is, while in, especially in the cases of deep learning, you can reduce the batch sizes to as less as uh, 30 or 40 uh, batches. Uh, I mean, you can fine tune from uh, even a couple of dozens to hundreds as well. Uh, but depending upon your problems, you can learn it. The problem uh, with this is that it assumes all right, sorry.
Is it because it's rubbing across the skin? I think. Wow. I look like a cyborg now. So, mini batches is another way where you can uh, reduce the batch process and keep partially fitting over the existing model. Uh, what it assumes is that the batch size is enough so that you are not um, uh, overfitting or you're not uh, skewing the model towards the particular data samples. And uh, the, just by putting an assumption that you need a minimum um, set of documents to update your models, you're essentially waiting for the documents to come in. This doesn't really work in online setting where um, either you don't have an estimation of when the tweets are going to come or um, it's just too late for you to act upon uh, a conversation um, uh, to be detected as spam or to be marked as spam. So, uh, and the third one, I'll, I'll perhaps come back again. Um, I think I didn't do a good just justice to explain this guy. Um, if only you're teaching it with the one data point, um, you are definitely going to skew up the models and um, your models will stop learning over time. So that doesn't work as well. I, I just invented this name called tiny batches for this. So third, uh, the last one also is uh, drift, which is also very interesting for us and I'm going to talk more about it. Um, drift is where um, the idea is can we periodically uh, identify that there is a distribution change and can we reset our learning uh, from some point? Um, and the, the problem is that detecting a drift in itself is a hard problem. And using the drift to essentially update your models is just a build upon it. So here is, I want to I will give you a flavor of uh, what worked for us, um, but also let me quickly step back and talk about what exactly was the problem which we were working on, which is, identifying spam, but the idea of spam also is that on social networks, on Twitter, the spam can just come uh, with a tweet uh, which was just went viral. And this is a conversation which perhaps um, um, a brand is getting flooded with tens of thousands of mentions, but they are not really, um, they don't really want to act upon it. So it's, it's essentially, it's brands or a user's decision to whether call it an importance or not. So this imposes us to really go and build per user statistical models and this is what we are seeing. So this is a, a setting what worked for us is here. What we have is a, a series of local models which means as the new users on board, there's a local model which is working for them. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a global model which works, which understands throughout the knowledge of, um, of this language of the data set. Uh, whereas the local model is very localized to the learning, localized to the data sets which this particular user is observing. Um, and also, uh, it's, it's a very fast learner, which means um, within a single feedback action, uh, it should be able to learn whether this is a spam or not. And it also um, uh, accommodates an instant feedback. Uh, which is where we talked about the mini batches and the tiny batches. Can we quickly update the model with the new learning? Um, this come together, um, there is a drift detection which we do and using that we can change some of the fine tune the parameters of how aggressively we want to update or how less aggressive we want to update. It gets together into a meta classifier which produces the final results. Um, I'm going to give you a quick brief overview of what each component is. Global model is a deep learning model. Uh, it's a CNN. Um, we have tried with 1D as well as uh, 2D uh, nets as well. We have seen that right off the shelf architecture gives us a 86% cross validation accuracy and it's built on a huge corpus. So we don't intend, uh, we have no intention to keep updating this model often. Uh, we have built the feedback loop um, where we model this in an online setting um, and this is how it works. So the data is modeled as a stream, it's coming in. Uh, model predicts an accuracy, says uh, if this is the label or not. 
the environment, which is essentially we wait for a human oracle, in this case, uh, the guy who's working on the system to give us a feedback whether this 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 was uh, um, a right prediction or not, because essentially it, it helps their workflows. So the moment the feedback comes, which means the, the moment the environment reveals the correct label, we incorporate that and update into the model. Um, these are some of the properties. These are uh, objectives which we want to we wanted to leverage from the local models. And uh, if you're going to go and experiment with online models, there's there's plenty of them. Um, but you need to set some of the objectives and properties of what you what you want to derive from it. This can help you choose one model over the other. So quick objectives. One, we want to strictly improve with the feedback. The whole idea is to improve. Uh, second, we want to have higher retention of uh, various concepts which we have learned in the history as well. Um, you can say it memory, but the but calling a model having a memory is a um, is a is a different. It's, it's not really mathematics. So um, he, here are the desired properties of a local model. Uh, it's one. It's an online setting, which means the feedback is coming. Uh, second, uh, it's a fast learner. Um, there is a lot more aggression in the feedback. It can instantaneously learn from a single feedback point as well. And I'm going to show you some of the charts ahead as well, how it works. Um, have this recency of the concepts. Uh, and we're going to, again, so what we're doing with these properties is we are help using these properties to build our test cases, build our evaluation strategies. So when you see the last one, which says, don't forget a recent I data points, we go into the last n, point, n, n data points, which the model had already seen before, and we ask it again, hey, by the way, do you remember all of these? And this is how it works. There's various online uh, models out there. You can put them to a test. This is a very nice nifty uh, scikit uh, script, which you can run against your data set and see what immediately performs better. Um, here is what we chose. We chose uh, Kramer's uh, passive aggressive variant two model, where um, we we have a lot more control on the aggressiveness of the parameters and the fine tuning. Um, it essentially works with the losses, and it can not only do classification, but it can do regression um, and ranking as well. Quick results. So you remember this how we built this architecture, here are the results. Um, oh, by the way, this is this is only online learning results. So if you run online learning model only on the data set, how it performs, we ran it on 100K data points and gave it a test, K, a test set of 50K uh, points. And it, it came across with an, uh, I would say, base classifier accuracy of 73%. Then we changed the whole approach. We said, okay, we're going to run the model in an online fashion, which means with each mistake, we're going to immediately, um, um, immediately, and in, in, in another experiment with certain delay, which is accommodating um, the human envi environment as well. So overall, in 50K data points, it, it went about and made 9,028 mistakes. Um, and these mistakes were fed back into the local system. Overall, we achieved an accuracy just in purely running in an online fashion, uh, almost 81.9%. So, which which is, is a gain of 9% accuracy just by incorporating an online feedback. So here it is. I mean, if you see, so the the top one is how many feedbacks which we received. Uh, overall, around 7,000 plus feedback, um, and. This is with the different parameters. So this is where you can tune a lot of parameters based on what your data is. Um, the, the below one uh, learns each and every. So these are the updates which are happening. And it flags one, means that it has remembered the moment uh, the feedback was made to it. And it was asked, hey, do you remember what was the label of that data point? Um, so it was able to remember it. In the above case, it. Uh, had a success rate of 10%. With some fine tuning, we got a success rate of 100%. Um, but there is a there is a catch to aggressiveness as well. So what happens uh, 
from a retention score of not just last one point, but let's go last 400 points in this case. I mean, you can um, optimize it to, uh, in your case, maybe 100 points. So we are looking at 400 points back, and we see that 74% of the time, we are able to remember the different concepts. So it's not, it's not that how many documents which I remember uh, from the last, but it's essentially how many concepts I'm remembering. It's possible that uh, the score goes down uh, if there are many concepts in the last 400 documents. Um, but this is, this is very decent, this is good. Uh, so what Meta Classifier does on top is it's another online model. Um, and, and intuitively so, because you, if you're in an online setting and your final output is going to come from a batch classifier, then it's not an online setting. So you have to put an online classifier on top. So we use an online stacking. Uh, we use, um, behind the stacking, there is a local classifier, which is um, an online classifier, and there is a deep learning classifier, which is a global one, which learns over a long time. Um, the outputs are fed into an online SPM. Uh, we wanted to use online SPM is because there is more stability um, from the weak classifier, which we used earlier, and there is a more stable classifier, which we are putting ahead of it. Um, we train the ensemble in the batch offline, but we keep it, uh, once it goes live, it stays in an online fashion. And uh, the cross-validation of uh, an online uh, ensemble is around 82% here as well, uh, which is um, pretty good on the kind of data set which we have. Um, here is what we are looking at over a time increase in the accuracy and uh, the running error rates. Um, it's it's if if you see it's a uh, it's a good progressive um, a slight good progressive I would say uh, as you increase the number of test sets um, and take it to perhaps a few millions as well there is a good possibility that you might be sitting on a really high um, performance and accuracy classifier um, quick summary I think this is the fastest thirty minute talk is it two thirty four <laughs> Summary. Um, so this this essentially is a is is a new learning method which you can see um, of building a continuous learners. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure which you need to support uh, if you're running such kind of systems in production. Um, this is also applicable to the domains, for instance, um, monitoring anomaly detection, where there is a you don't perhaps know what is the second class. It's, there's a need for one class classifiers, which means this is one versus all. Um, there is in recommendations where there is a per user statistical model, which is capturing the importance of the behaviors of the users. Um, it can also work on stock market predictions if somebody wants to uh, bet some money on there. Um, and if they're able to uh, understand this stock market drifts as well. Hard problem. There is a lot more work which you can build on top of it. Um, uh, think of uh, using RNNs instead of the CNNs. Uh, think of using different variations of online learners, which includes Arrow. Somebody's sleeping. See, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that blame. <laughs> Um, use character embeddings uh, where there is, uh, I mean, look at Twitter. Uh, there is acronyms, there is morphological changes, there is induced spelling mistakes. Um, your vocabularies are not going to necessarily match. Even you can run phenemes on top of it. Uh, they all become over-added complexities. Uh, character embedding looks promising. Uh, you should check that out. Um, there is... Uh, there is a lot more sophisticated methods of handling drift. Uh, we were using um, error-based uh, DDRs, which we call. Uh, there is uh, there is a more sophisticated way where we haven't uh, spent much time into, um, but essentially it 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 is built for ensemblers of multiple. Um, um, so if you have a huge ensembling system, uh, DDD can capture different distributions and and try to trigger that particular ensemble as well. So it's a, um, it's, it's, it's an area of research actively. Thank you. Um, I worked on this um, with uh, Anuj, so I'm gonna call Anuj as well in case you have questions we can both answer together. We work in Freshdesk, um, we recently joined there. 
um, we were working in uh, a company called Airwood, which Freshness acquired earlier this year. Thank you. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So, uh, question. So, actually, it's a two-part question. Uh, over here. Over here. Here. <laughs> So, two-part question. First thing is, since you are using cross-validation, so I'm curious, did you maintain causality in your train versus test set? So that is, your test set should be temporarily in a later point of time compared to your training set. Second thing is, uh, the feedback that you provided. The did what? you The feedback. The feedback. So you're supplying your response back to the system. Did you use teacher feedback, or did you try to see what happens if you use a teacher feedback signal as an additional signal? Can, can, can you repeat the last part again? Uh, have you tried to analyze the impact of teacher feedback? So teacher feedback would be, uh, imagine that your classifier's correct response should be one for that particular input sample, right. but uh, essentially your classifier predicted zero. So you're supplying not only zero, which is the classifier's prediction, but also a teacher feedback signal, which would be the correct signal at this point of time should be one. So it's a, it's a supervised feedback signal of actually what the prediction should be. So in most of the time, so the, the reason why you do that is uh, you need to essentially model the distribution, the noise. So feedback is a noisy signal, right? So you have to have some kind of an opponent way to model the noise in your feedback, right? Yeah. So that distribution. So did yeah. you try that out? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There, there is a lot of ways you can synthetically create noise inside your database, uh, inside your data sets. Um, we were blessed with Twitter as a language. You know, Twitter is a very noisy medium. So even uh, the large corpus which we were using, uh, there were a lot of noise samples within those two. And we captured them. Um, I don't mean the noise in the data. The noise in your classifier's response. So uh, the Twitter data is noisy, fine, given, right? But your classifier is going to have a noisy prediction. Just, just by the fact that you have a noisy label, you essentially have uh, the same. Uh, the model also is is going to become. It it will capture the noise itself because the data is noisy. So when I'm saying the data is noisy, which means that the label is noisy. All right, fair enough. And the causality part? The causality? Yeah. So actually, the the whole data set is sorted in time. So it actually has the, the causality built into it. Yeah. What we trained on it is, I think, the first first half half of the year. And what we test, tested is on the second half of the year. And to answer the second question, uh, what we provide as a feedback is the right label for that text. See, in our environment, it's the user who is the ultimate decision maker whether this is a noise or an actionable. Because what is noise for you may, may not be a noise for me, and vice versa. So when, we, when the classifier gives for a text zero, and the user says, hey, this is not zero, this is one, what goes back into the fifth system is the data point, and the correct label which is provided by the user. That is the teacher feedback. Yeah, and we also incorporate the uh, the delay which could be caused in the in the real life. Otherwise, the feedback is not going to come instantaneously. Thank you. Any other questions? So, uh, can you can you shed some light about the uh, the architecture of how how you are passing back the feedback to the the model itself? So, I think let's look at this slide. And actually, I wanted to do one more slide. Um, so here's the thing: uh, the meta classifier is in an online setting too, uh, which means whenever the feedback comes, the feedback flows all the way to the local feedbacks as well. So if you if you um, um, visualize the data flow, the data flow is, uh, is 
it, it's coming right into the meta classifier for the prediction. The meta classifier, um, if, if, if the predictions are right, we are not making any updates at all. We are only making updates when the predictions are wrong. And each of this uh, uh, meta classifier chooses which local model to interact with. Because th these are, again, these are per user models. So we, we look up into our HDF stores and figure out which models is going to get into the ensembling layer. So you're maintaining the identifiers for each of the... Absolutely, copies. absolutely. Thanks. All right. Hey, thank you so much.